morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It is very, very wet outside, but it is dry in here. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you here on the Sabbath day, and we're grateful to be here. Lord, we're grateful that you have successfully brought us through this last week. Every single person here has had their own struggles. Mm -hmm. And Lord, it is by your grace and your mercy that we come here before you to thank you. And Lord, to ask forgiveness for our sins and cleansing from unrighteousness. And grace and strength to help in time of need for this coming week. Lord, we pray that as we worship here, that you will be with my voice, that you will be with the words that I speak, that you will be with each person here who listens. Lord, that you would give them a message personally of peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I'm here and I'm going to tell you a story. This is a true story. I think people who speak from the pulpit should probably only tell true stories probably most of the time. But just for clarity, so that you know that this has its origins in reality. <clears throat> Back in 1944, there was a man by the name of Hiru Onada. And Hiru Onada was a youth. He was 18 years of age. And uh, from 1939 to 1945, there was this big global event going on. You might have heard of it. It was called the Second World War. And Hiru Onada, as you might have guessed from his name, was from Japan. And he had turned 18 years of age, and he had decided that he had had a, enough of the dance clubs uh, that he had been hanging out in, uh, in China. He was working in China. And he enlisted in the military. Now, Hiro Onada, at the tender age of 18, studied survival, martial arts, military propaganda, and um, espionage. And uh, he was stationed in the Philippines on Lubong Island. And he was instructed this, make war on the piers, and on the airfields of the Allies, specifically the Americans and the Filipinos, because Lubong Island, uh, Lubong Island is in the Philippines. Make war on the piers and on the airfields. Live off the land. And under no circumstances, take your life. And so, when he arrived there in 1944, it was December 26th that he arrived on the island stationed there, and uh, some of the people who were outranking him, they sort of interfered with uh, some of the work that he was supposed to do, and in February 1945, the Allied forces landed at Lubong Island, and a series of battles ensued, but they were very quick, and uh, the, the Allied forces took control of the island, and most of Hiru Onada's uh, fellow soldiers, they were either killed in action or they surrendered. But Hiru Onada had been told what? Never surrender and do not take your life. And in fact, somebody had told him, his commanding officer had told him, stay here, live off the land, make war, I'll be back for you. It might take three to five years, but I'll be back for you. And so, when Hiro Onada saw that the Allied forces were overrunning the island, they had taken over everything, he and two other men, they, they got up into the hills, he ordered them, let's get out of here. So they went and they lived in the mountains. And from their mountain vantage point, they continued to make war on the Allies. Now, I want you to think about these three men. I want you to picture them in your mind. A 
approximately 18 or 19 years of age, young, obviously young, um, you know, 18 or 19 years of age, enlisted in the war, they've been hanging out in the dance clubs, you know, now they're soldiers in uniform on the island, and now they're living up in the mountains, the three of them. And there's a war going down. The air, the the the, the planes are landing on the air uh, on the airstrip, and the boats are coming to the pier. And these three guys are up there. And at nighttime they would come down, and they would make war on the Allies. And as you know, if you know from your history, the Second World War ended on August 15, 1945. And that was it. It was over. But these guys up in the mountains, they had no idea that the war had finished. They had no idea that the war was over. And so these, these three guys, they kept coming down into the, into the villages, and they're burning rice crops, burning rice fields, burning the rice that's been harvested. And the villagers are like, Hold up a second here. You know, we saw these three guys in Japanese uniforms running around in the village burning our rice piles at night last night. You know, we got to do something about this. And so the government came out and they made a public service announcement with a loudspeaker. The war is finished. Come down from the mountain. But these three Japanese guys, they were like, that's propaganda. We've studied propaganda. Okay, we know all about the tricks that the enemy plays. We're not falling for that. And so six months passed, and there was an official leaflet dropped by the Japanese government uh, from the emperor. The planes flew overhead, and they threw these leaflets out of the out of the airplane, right? And so you know, I mean, if you've ever been to the Philippines, um, you know, it's very lush, it's very jungle, jungly. Uh, and, and Lubang Island is just like that, very mountainous, very lush, very beautiful, and th these leaflets are being pushed out of the airplane, and they're falling all over the place. And sure enough, uh, Hiro Onada and his friends, uh, they, they, they're walking along and they see a leaflet on the ground. So they pick it up, and they look at it, the war is over, those clever allies. <laughs> Look, it's even in Japanese. Because of course, at this point in time, there were all there was no cell phones. And there are all of these soldiers, and they're living out in the mountains. And they don't know that the war is over. Well, years pass. And Hiro Onada and his friends are living in caves, and they are surviving on bananas and coconuts and the occasional iguana. And, um, it tastes like chicken. And, um, I always get a kick out of the news stories about Fort Lauderdale and Miami when the weather gets cold and the iguanas fall out of the tree. You know, these iguanas, some of these iguanas are, are four feet long. You know, they're very big, right? And they've got the, these big muscly legs. I mean, there's a lot of good eating on the I mean, not if you're a vegetarian, but, um, as an aside, I, this I'm totally interrupting my own story here, but um, I, when my wife and I went down to Fort Lauderdale, there was an iguana running across the road, and uh, I caught it, and uh, it was big, it was almost four feet long, and uh, we put a bow around it, and we and we took it to Christmas, uh, the Christmas dinner in Fort Lauderdale, we put it underneath the tree, and all the kids took a picture with it, we walked around with it on a leash, and then we let it go. Anyways, they're, I mean, these are big, these are big creatures, and... Um, Hiro Onada, Onada and his fellows, they were eating the iguanas. <clears throat> but, you know, only occasionally did they get an iguana. Mostly what they were eating was bananas, coconuts, and the occasional rice that they could steal from the villagers. You know, and the villagers, the villagers were upset because you have these three guys coming down at nighttime, burning the rice fields, and so the, the villagers, they called the police force. And, you know, they... They decided they were going to do a search, a search uh, mission for these guys, but really they wanted to shoot them. And, uh, and so the police would go up into the hills and, and 
and um, Hiro Onada and his two buddies, they would have these fights with the police. And, um, uh, you know, one day, one of his buddies was wounded in the leg. And so Hiro Onada took him back into the cave, and he nursed him back to health so that he could continue making war on the Allies. And this situation continued with the three of them till 1952, whereupon one of them was shot and killed, and there was only two left. Now you would think that um, this might confirm that you know, the war is over, the fact that they had gone this long. But they had been told by the Imperial Army of Japan that the war would take 100 years to win. And they had been told that no Japanese person would ever surrender. It would never happen. And so these now two men continued to make war on the Allies until 1970. 1970. Whereupon one of them was in a with, was in a fight with the police, the Filipino police. I mean, if you think of this, it's the longest war in history. Okay. They started in 1944, now we're in 1970, and they are still fighting the police. Right? They think it's the Allied armies. They think it's the Americans and the Filipino forces, the army. One of them was shot and killed. And, uh, and so then it only left Hiro Onada. And Hiro Onada had been the subject of several government initiatives. Um, obviously, he was. When we think about who he was, he was a fiercely loyal soldier. You know, he had been loyal to the Japanese government for all of these years. He had been loyal to the war effort. He had lived in rocks and caves. Um, he had been living in difficult circumstances. So he was fiercely loyal, fiercely principled, willing to endure hardship. Okay, and he had been schooled in propaganda. And so, the Japanese government, they kept hearing stories that, that these guys were out there on the island. And so they, they did another initiative. They did another leaflet drop, but this time they personalized it. Okay? So I want you to think about this. You think about this man. He's in the jungle. Okay? He's making war on the Allies. He's always looking. I'm, there's somebody always out to get me. There's an unseen enemy, and there's a seen enemy, and I'm watching everywhere. One day he's walking through the jungle and he picks up a package and inside it says, Hiro Onada, the war is over. It's finished. It's over. And there's a picture of his family. And he looks at this and he thinks to himself, this is unbelievable propaganda. This is highly personalized. This is highly personalized propaganda. These allies, man, you got to give them credit. Um, you know, the, the police just shot your buddy, right? So we know the war is not finished. So he doesn't come down. 1972 comes. And this guy, by the name of Nokia, Nokio Suzuki. Nokio Suzuki is a, he's a, he's a student at the university, but he's taking some time off and he's going to go travel. And so he's traveling around the world, and he gets back to the Philippines. And he tells his friends, he says, I'm looking for three things on this planet. I want to see. He said, I want to see Hiro Onada, a panda and the abominable snowman. <laughs> In that order. And so he got to Lubong Island. And he went out into the hills. He was all by himself. He's living in a tent. Hiro Onada is out there. He's living in a cave. And as miracles would have it, after four days of Suzuki out there in the mountains in a tent, uh, he met Hiro Onada. And uh, so the two of them met. The man who had been now out there in, at war with the Allies for 30 years now, and Suzuki, who was looking for him. And wouldn't you know it, they become friends. And they're sitting around the campfire, and Suzuki says to him, 
you know, the war is over. And uh, Onada says, I, I was told here by my superior office, officer that he would be back here to get me. I cannot surrender. I am at war. Nobody has told me not to make war. As far as I'm concerned, the war is on. I don't know if you're telling the truth. So they took a picture together, and Suzuki went back to Japan. And he showed the picture to the Japanese government, and he said, I met this guy. He's out there living in his fatigues from 30 years ago in the mountains, making war on the Allies. He's still going down and stealing rice and stuff like that. And, uh, and so the Japanese government went and they found the, his original officer who had told him, who had stationed him, who had told him to live off the land, who had told him to never surrender and never take your own life. They found this guy. He had long since surrendered and he was a bookseller. And they get this guy and they fly him back over to Lugong Island. And finally, after 30 years, Hiro Onada and his commanding officer met. And his commanding officer said, it's time to surrender. The war is finished. And so, Hiro, it was arranged for Hiro Onada to meet the, the Filipino president, uh, Marcos. And uh, he handed him his sword. He had a samurai sword. He had uh, a machine gun. He had 500 rounds of ammunition. Still. And he had a bunch of live grenades. And he had kept them for 30 years. And when he handed his sword over to the emperor, or over to the, uh, the president of the Philippines, he handed his sword to the president of the Philippines. He wept uncontrollably. Now, just think about what it would be like. Like, consider this, man. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. You will get back here. I, I can go back here. Think about this man. He's up in the mountains. He is at war for 30 years. How stressful do you think that is? To be at war. When he was examined afterwards by physicians, the doctor said, that he was like a wild animal. They said, well, his eyes. He was actually, he was a very dignified, reserved, and, uh, and professional individual. Very detail-oriented, very meticulous, very polite. But his eyes, they said, were the eyes of a wild animal. They moved everywhere constantly, right? Picking up the details of everything. And that, that's the way that he had lived for 30 years. He was being hunted. So, in his mind, and he was making war in his mind. Think about how stressful that is, but think about how stressful it would be, or what a relief it would be, by contrast, to find out that your war against another person was in, in, a, in a conflict that was finished 30 years ago, or 29 years ago. Imagine what the relief would be like to find out that you, what you had been doing, you were engaged in a war, in a battle that wasn't even going on. You didn't even have an enemy anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to think about this as well. <clears throat> Every time he went down to make war on the villagers, and he burned a rice field, or he stole a cow, I mean, I probably didn't steal very many cows, but, you know, every time he stole a chicken, maybe, you know, or he stole some rice, he was expecting what? Reciprocity. Yeah. He was expecting reciprocity. He was expecting revenge. And the reason is, is because he was engaged in a war with an enemy. He did not know that the enemy was not at war with him. Interestingly enough, when they found him uh, and he had surrendered and he was evaluated, they said, this is just an aside, they said that he was one of the healthiest 52-year-olds in Japan. Um, they said uh, he had been living off of coconuts and, and bananas, of course, and his occasional lizard. Um, uh, but he 
was in, in, in very fine condition. And they said that his mind was more um, uh, like uh, healthy than the people who were living in society and the pollution and all of the excitement of modern day society. Just an interesting aside. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that he had been at war in a conflict that had ended 29 years before. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles, please. <clears throat> to Hebrews 11, verse 3. Having made peace 
through the blood of his cross. Okay? We heard about Zacchaeus. We heard about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. It was from the vantage point of the tree that he saw the Savior. It was from the vantage point of that tree that he got a correct look at who God was. And it is from the vantage point of the cross that we get a look at who God is. Yeah. What does this say here? It says in verse 20, in verse 19, It pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of His cross. It says that He has made peace with the blood of His cross. That the peace is made. Interestingly enough, when Jesus spread his arms forth and said, it is finished, the word finished in Greek does not just mean presently finished. It means it was finished before, it is finished today, it will forever be finished. And so, the peace has been made by the blood of the cross. I want you to think about Hiro Onada. Hiro Onada did not know that there had been peace between the Emperor of Japan and the Allies 29 years before. That peace was something that already existed, and he was alone fighting in a war that did not exist. Now let's continue reading in 1st King, Colossians chapter 19, uh, in Colossians chapter 1. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you, that were sometimes alienated and enemies, don't miss this, in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. It says that Jesus, in the body of his flesh, reconciled all things. Now this is a mystery. We talked about it at Vespers last week. It's a mystery. I'm not, you know, as far as expounding the mystery. But the fact is, is that the Bible says that Jesus Christ has made peace with all things from the Father's perspective. Okay? It's not, a, it's not a peace that is going to happen. According to the words, it is finished. It is that it is finished. Okay? And then it says, you who are alienated in your minds by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, to present you, um, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard. And so, you think about Hiro Onada. Speaking of wicked works, being alienated in your minds by wicked works, what does wicked works do to your perspective about other people? If I steal something from somebody else. It makes that person an enemy in my mind, even if that person hasn't wronged me. Even if that person doesn't know that I stole anything. What does it do when you do a wicked work against somebody? It makes you think that there is reciprocity. It makes you think that you are going to have vengeance against you. It makes you think that you deserve punishment. When you are alienated in your wicked works, by your wicked works, in your mind, the verse says. The alienation is in your mind. Yet now has he reconciled. And so, the, the perspective that I want, to, I want to share with you today is that you, God is not at war with you. He is not at war with you. Amen. He has made peace through the blood of his cross with humanity. Yes. And He has given us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is the same word that was on those pamphlets that were dropped to Hiro Onada that he did not believe. 
And that is that the war is over. Jesus himself has said, it is finished. It is finished. This time since that point in time is for people to receive.